midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. The next thing to look for is a supernatural sign in the heavens. A messenger is going to fly above the earth to warn of the terror to come with the next three judgments. You see, there are three angels still standing before God waiting for their command to carry out their tasks. And the magnitude of these judgments reaches a new level, a supernatural level. No human mind could even dream up such terror that's coming. This messenger is described as an eagle flying through the smoke-filled sky, saying with a loud voice, Woe! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels that are about to sound. Now, in our Lord's continuing efforts to save his people from the final judgment at the end of man's time, he gives another sign and another opportunity to repent before being destroyed. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. After the inhabitants of the earth have been told what is to come, the fifth angel is blowing its trumpet and its associated curse is released on the earth. An angel is seen holding the keys to the abyss, or sometimes called the bottomless pit. He unlocks and opens the door to the abode of the demons. And when this fiery pit is opened, smoke rises into the already contaminated environment so that the remaining light is even darkened more for a time. It's what's coming out of the pit, though, through this smoke that will terrorize those who are rejecting God for the next five months. Demon locusts, like nothing anybody has ever seen or will ever see again, they're going to ascend upon the planet. Unlike ordinary locusts, they don't eat grass and trees. These locusts have a king, a leader over them. His name in Hebrew is called Abaddon, and the survivors of the earth will know of him as the destroyer. They swarm over the earth with such numbers that the sound of their wings alone brings terror, and they are going to be given power to hurt men. These locusts have tails like scorpions, and they use them to sting all who have not taken this seal of God on their foreheads. Remember the 144,000 and how they were sealed on their foreheads by God? They're going to be left alone. Now, if you're wondering whether you're going to be left alone if you become a believer, I really can't answer that for sure. I'd like to think so, but Scripture only tells us that those marked on their foreheads, the 144,000, those Jewish evangelists, tells us that they're going to be left alone. Now, all believers are sealed by the Holy Spirit. I hope that this is the same thing. We're given a vivid description of these terrorists from the abyss, and it's just beyond imagination. The shape of the locust, this is what scripture says, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads were crowns, of something like gold, and their, their faces looked almost like the faces of men. And they had hair, like woman's hair. And their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had a breastplate, like breastplates of iron. 
and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. And they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men for five months. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Now our scene is back in heaven, and we see the golden altar again where the prayers of the saints cry out for God to do something about the evil men in the world. A voice is heard commanding the sixth angel to sound his trumpet and to begin to execute judgment that's under his authority. Well, this angel is told to loose four demons that had previously been bound at the Euphrates River for that very day. And they're going to lead the demon horsemen on their crusade to destroy a third of those that are still alive. Two hundred million mounted demonic forces come forth from the pit with one purpose and that is to kill and destroy. That's what demons do when they're not prevented by God. Consider the moral condition of mankind at this time. People are doing whatever seems right in their own eyes with little or no restrictions. Drug use is going to be at a new level not yet seen. There'll be no sexual morality. Marriage is going to be nearly non-existent by that time. People will actually worship demons and, and idols that they've made with their own hands. Most of the remaining population is still rejecting God's warnings and they're embracing the very things that are destroying them. Now these demonic horsemen are riding some horse-like creatures never before seen, and the horses themselves are doing the killing. Now, interestingly enough, the word for horses is actually the word that's translated as sos, S-O-O-S. And it literally means, in the, in the Greek language, means a, a leaper, something that leaps up and comes back down. Now, of course, in 1611, when the King James translators were, were taking the, the Bible and translating it into English, I'm sure they were trying to sit around and figure out, well, what kind of a thing can a man ride on that, that leaps up and comes back down? And the best thing they could think of in those days were horses. But listen to what the scripture says about these leapers. It says they have heads like lions. In other words, they roar. And out of their mouths come fire and smoke and brimstone that's able to kill. And their tails are like serpents having heads which they can injure. And also, if they knew in 1611 what you and I know today, I don't think we would have called them horses. We would have thought maybe they were something more like a, a military aircraft, like a helicopter. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. We've now come to the middle of the tribulation. It's been approximately three and a half years since the rapture of God's people. Now I'd like to talk about some other events that are taking place. In the city of Jerusalem, two men will soon appear on the scene. They'll descend from heaven 
with a very special mission to witness for Jesus to those living in Jerusalem during the second three and a half year period known as the Great Tribulation. It'll be given to them the ability to work great signs and wonders. They're going to cause a great famine during the time of their mission, and they're going to smite the earth with all sorts of plagues as often as they want, and they'll destroy all who will attempt to hurt or kill them. During this time, many will despise these two witnesses for the judgments that they're carrying out. These men will prophesy of the coming of our Lord Jesus, and they're going to preach of his love and his forgiveness during the time of the greatest persecution of Jesus and his followers that the earth has known. Right in the middle of Antichrist's betrayal of Israel, breaking his seven-year treaty with Israel and trampling of God's holy city, Jerusalem, and defiling of the temple. This should be encouraging to the believer, or those soon to believe, but to those who are rejecting God, they're going to be terrifying. If you pick up something hot and you realize quickly enough, you, you'll drop it. Maybe you won't be burnt badly or even burnt at all. Most of us don't like pain, but sometimes a little pain saves us much greater pain if we heed its warnings. Whatever your sin is, drop it now. Just let it go. Heed the warnings that God has been giving you before it destroys you. So whether you're in the holy city of Jerusalem or whether you're watching or listening through some news service, the message is the same. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now we come to the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet. And that marks the midpoint of the tribulation of the earth for those living during this time. From your place on earth, the sounding of this trumpet is marked with thunder and lightning earthquakes, great hail. It's like the earth itself got a chill up and down its spine from the North Pole to the South Pole, anticipating what is to come. Heaven is full of activity and rejoicing over God exercising all power and authority and bringing to an end the reign of terror and evil on earth forever. This seventh trumpet sounding in heaven at the command of God brings the final countdown, which are seven bowls or, or vials full of the wrath of God. They're going to be poured out in sequence on evil. Seven final judgments ending with Jesus coming back to personally destroy Satan and his Antichrist, uh, along with all of his followers which have rejected God. 